Good morning to the Commonwealth. This is Young Honey with Raw Dog Radio, bringing you the greatest old-time radio station since the bombs fell. We're going to be hitting you with an arrangement of ragtime on a bridge stories and other old world medias. I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. Now, without further commentary, we're starting off with Frontier Gentlemen, a late 1950s story collection by John Denton. In Cheyenne, Wyoming Territory, I learned a little about trail herders and a lot more about the education of Kid Yancey. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall. Frontier Gentlemen. <laughs> My friend Carrie Chase of the Cheyenne Daily Press had mentioned to me that a herd of Texas cattle was expected in town, and with it its dozen or so trail drivers. They had followed the Texas Trail from San Antonio across those great plains into Oklahoma Territory, Kansas, Nebraska, fording rivers like the Brazos, the Trinity, Red River, the Washita, Cimarron, Arkansas, Smoky Hill, the South Platte, 2,000 animals traveling a 1,000 miles, and 12 men to bring them safely in. The day of their arrival, I was being shaved in a barber shop, one of the several which served the local and transient population of Cheyenne. Suddenly, the mugs and bottles on the barber's shelf began to tremble. The air was shattered with the sound of voices bellowing, shrieking, howling. The hand of Mr. Winters, my barber, began to shake. What is it? Texans. What? Texians. Oh, oh. Yeah, they ain't started shooting up the place yet. Maybe this time they'll let us alone. And... No, I guess not. Oh. Oh. Mister, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I surely am, but I tell you, when those fellas come to town for a blowout, a shooting and a hollering, it, it boogers the wax right out of me. Do they cause much trouble? trouble. You see them holes in the ceiling? A yeah. couple of months back, three of them come in here for to get cleaned up. Before they was gone, they drunk up three bottles of liniment, emptied out their shooting irons up there, one of them stripped clean naked, poured a dozen bottles of pompadour oil over himself, then got chased down the street by the other two. I never did get paid for <laughs> one nickel of it. I'd like to have seen that. I'll tell you, Half a Cheyenne did. You tell three women fainted dead away. I'm just hoping ain't none of them going to come in here the trip. Well, I, I should imagine that after a thousand-mile cattle drive, they're rather inclined to let go. Mister, you ain't seen nothing till you seen a Texas cowpuncher letting go. Right now they'll be up in the saloons heisting a glass or two. Just enough to get the dust out of their throats. Then they'll head for the nearest barber and get the wool cleaned up. After that, the real fun starts. Why, some of them boys has got two, three hundred dollars to spend. And it sure don't take them long to do it. Uh, then what happens? Mm, they, maybe two, and they're busted. And they hit the trail for another six months' work till they ride back again. That's the way it goes. I tell you, Nick, first I've got to get me a shave. Oh. Kid, you cut off them straggle feathers of yarn. They ain't never going to see the light of day again. Let them be. Morning, Good oh, morning, Mr. Morning. Boss, man. Uh, cool your saddles. 
Won't be but a few minutes. Yeah, well, now we ain't got too much time, mister. We all got to be getting up to the whiskey mill. Now, sit down, kid. You ain't going to no whiskey mill. Oh, now, look out here, Nick. I told you and I was going to... And I told you, boy. I promised your ma I was going to watch out for you, and I ain't going back on it. Ain't going to be no whiskey and no women. Yeah, but this here shy and Nick, why, I heard that I they... don't matter none what you heard. Uh, you boys been in town long? Nope. We just rode in. Can you all hear us going by? We sure was bellering fine and loud, man. You Texas boys? We sure are. Now, now, now there ain't going to be no trouble in here. Shoot, but... mister, we don't even make no trouble. Kid and me, we just figured to prettify ourselves. Why, sure. Are you the gentleman who brought in that herd from San Antonio? Us and the other boys, yes, sir. Well, I, I wonder if I can talk to you about that. Talk? Ain't nothing much to talk about, mister. We just rub them up, same as we always do, that's all. Now, I'm a newspaper man. I'd like to buy you a drink, get some material for a story on trail herding. Hey, now, that's a mighty fine idea, ain't it, Nick? Not for you, it ain't, kid. Oh, man, I swear, one of these days I'm just going to cut out your lights if you don't quit riding the line on me. Yeah. There. There you are, mister. That's fine. Uh, thanks very much. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Next. Yeah, I want a real artistic scrape and a proper cut. Uh, kid don't need no shave, just pluck the wool off him. Yes, sir. Um, my name is J.B. Kendall. Howdy. Nick Carmody. That day Yearlin's Kid Yancey. Howdy, Kendall. Ain't got a bottle on you, have you, Pard? No, no, I'm afraid not. Uh, listen, kid, while you're getting fixed up, uh, I'll waltz on over to the store and get me some tobacco. Sure. All right, Nick. You don't go flagging your kite out of here the minute I'm gone, because I got your De Niro. You ain't going to get far in this man's town without it. I ain't going nowhere, Nick. All right. Come with me, Kendall? Yes, I'd like to. I'll tell you what it's like when we hit a dry stretch. Get souls them cows ain't got no spit left. Like the keel over. But if they smell water, they'll go 20, 30 miles at the trot after it. Which is just what I'm going to do. Except I'll take that drink you was offering. Where's the closest? Uh, Bill's place a few doors down. Hey, man, playing Mother Nelly to the kid can sure give a man the thirst. Are you related? No. His ma didn't want him to go. His pa said he should. His pa's the old man down San Antonio. Old man? Owns the outfit. Ah. Told me to keep an eye out for the boy. No drinking, no women. Said they'd break his mother's heart. You ever try riding herd on a snuffy kid that's got a mind to be a man? <laughs> I can't say that I have. And never again. I give him a word I'd do it, but never again. I'd as soon twist a loco bronc. Just one good shot of scamper juice, and I'll be a new man. Mr. Comedy's intentions were good, but one good shot led to another, and that was in turn followed by two more. Ten minutes later, the cowhand had discovered that walking was a lost art. Tearfully, he begged me to return to the barber shop and claim his charge. He handed me a pouched handkerchief for safekeeping. In it, he told me, was the saving of some two hundred dollars belonging to Kid Yancey. Kendall, I hear the owl of hooting high. Somebody's gone and stole my rudder. <laughs> oh, I ain't in no condition. Oh, I think of the kid's maw, tearing and hollering for a boy who learned bad ways on account of there ain't no Nick Carmody to set him on the right trail. Ah, you go get him, Kendall. I'll be waiting. Waiting right here. Barkeep, another bottle of that nose paint. Oh, no. Look here, man. I say, come. Well, you won't even listen to me. Uh, you Comedy. tell him Nick said listen or buy a whiskey, I'll hang up his high. Hey, you tell him that. Yes, but it's really none of my business. Oh, you want to see a little calf go strain on this range with you? We get eaten alive. All right. But you stay here, Comedy. I'll bring him back in two minutes. You well, yeah, you, you should have been a Texan, mister. Well, how? Well, I beg your pardon. Well, I'll be Mr. Well, Kendall, honey. Well, of course, you're 
You're Millie. That's right, up in Helena. A big Sam's friend. Uh, his used to be friend. Oh? Yeah. After what happened between you and him and the judge putting him in the hoose scout, he ain't got no friend no more. He, uh, lost all his money, too. He, he's not here in Cheyenne. I'll say he ain't. Last I heard, he was mule skinning for an outfit in Utah. Yes, Oh, I swear you sure ain't things a bit, Mr. Candle Baby. What are you doing in these parts? Oh, still writing. And you, Millie? Oh, well, uh, I got me a job. I, uh, I kind of work here in the Ah, I see. Yes, that's, uh... Oh, good Lord, I forgot. There's a young fellow in the barber shop. I've got to bring him back. Oh, gee, well, it, uh, it's sure swell seeing you again, Mr. Campbell. And you, Millie? I uh, sure never did think I'd see you again, Mr. Campbell. Uh, Millie, I, I hope you won't think I'm being rude, but... Oh, uh, honey, I, I have... never think you was rude. Now, let you and me go round up that kid. Then you come back and buy me a drink, and we'll talk about old times. Oh, them Texas boys. They sure do love to shoot off them things. Just like big, bad. I'm going to get the law down on you. Uh, Hunter Tubbers while he's killing the West. Now stop when it. When I'm hungry, I bite you off the noses of live Comanche. I can... <laughs> hey, howdy, Mr. Kendall. Oh. Hey. Hey. Howdy, ma'am. Your friend is waiting for you at the saloon. Just, just look at all he's done. Shooting up my place. I I told you, mister, I told you what they was like. I was just doing some target practice is all. I've got your money here, kid. You better pay for the damage. Hey, sure, sure. How much, mister? Well, I figure five dollars ought to cover it. Uh, here. How much obliged for the wool clipping, mister? Oh, yeah. Say, so, uh... Ain't you going to introduce me to your friend there, Mr. Kendall? Um, oh, yes. Uh, Millie, this is the kid, uh, Mr. Yancey. Howdy, Mill. What do you say, kid? Well, I heard tell they got some mighty pretty fillers in the north, and I never did reckon on finding anything like you. <laughs> you ain't got a lot of years in you, kid, but you sure learned how to use them talking to a woman. You, um, you, you, you better give me that money to hold for you, kid. I'll give it back to Carmody. Oh, oh there's two hundred dollars in there. I ain't to have myself a time with it. <laughs> two hundred dollars, my. That's a heap of money. Yes, ma'am. A fellow ought to be able to have a heap of fun with it. <laughs> uh, why don't you wait out here? Millie and I will bring Carmody out. Heck no, we're all going in. I'll be obliged if y'all take my arm, Miss Millie. Ma'am. Why, kid, honey... I'd be honored. In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. These are stimulating days in America's history, days when our problems arise from positive and dynamic factors, offering opportunities for still more positive and dynamic growth in their solution. The school shortage problem reflects the rapid increase in population and the ever higher levels of education that every citizen wants for his children. Crowded highways reflect the fact that Americans in general buy more cars, travel widely, and enjoy more leisure. Shortages in housing, in industry, in hospitals reflect our rising standard of living. Great changes bring new needs. New needs create endless new opportunities for work, production, and investment. Opportunities that are open to practically every person in America today. To find out how they may apply to you, get a free booklet full of the facts about our expanding economy. Write to Box 1776, Grand Central Station, New York 17, New York, for the booklet called Your Great Future in a Growing America. That's Box 1776, Grand Central Station, New York 17, New York. And now, we return you to the Anthony Ellis production of Frontier Gentlemen. We went into Bill's place, Millie and the kid walking a pace ahead of me. They made quite a picture. Millie, as I described her before, a woman of rather extraordinary proportions. 
I should guess that she was some five foot ten in height, and suffice to say that her frame was amply covered. Her escort, Kid Yancey, stood five foot eight and a half in his boots, and dripping wet, could have weighed no more than 130 pounds. Millie's arm was linked through the boys in what appeared to be a grip of iron. She had seen the $200 and wasn't about to let it slip away from her. The kid and Millie found the table, and I brought a thoroughly befuddled Nick Carmody over to join me. Here's the text. Your mother could see you now, kid. Here's the text. Dynamite, ain't it? You've got to drink it down fast, kid, mm. not, else you're likely to rot your teeth out. The kid's got a mother. Sweet, gray-haired old lady. Oh, everybody's got a sweet, gray-haired old mother, honey. Don't you fret none. I'll take care of him just like he was my own kin. <laughs> Millie, you are a wicked woman. Yeah, you watch your language, huh, mister. Ain't no one going to talk to this here lady like that. Oh, that's all right, kid, honey. Mr. Kendall and me... We're old friends from up Montana territory. Now, I wouldn't drink any more of that if I were you, kid. Oh, now, shoot, Mr. Kendall ain't had but a sup. I figure it's time I was growed up. Oh, heck, when we was up in Dodge, all the fellas was painting their noses good. All except me. I had to stay in camp. Same thing every place we went. Well, I reckon things is going to be different now. Ain't that so, ma'am? Oh, it sure is. You're a big boy now, kid. I broke my swear to his poor old ma. Drinking and carrying on with women. Oh, no, ain't your fault, Nick. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, you know what? Now I'm hungry. You're hungry, ma'am? Well, now you mention it, I don't recollect having had nothing to eat yet this morning. Hey, they got any grub in this place? Why, sure, honey. You tell little Millie what she wants. She'll get it for you. Eggs! How about $20 worth of eggs? How about that, Nick? Your sweet old mother crying her eyes out. You, Mr. Kendall? I don't think so, thank you. I'll tell the cook, honey boy. Well, now, ma'am, that's mighty kind of you. I'm coming with you. I sure admire to tell the cook how I like my eggs. Why, sure, kid. Don't go away, Mr. Kendall. We'll be right back. Oh, Miss Miller, you sure got the most beautiful smile I ever did. Comedy. Nick. Nick, wake up. Wake hey. up. We little gray mother hair. Wake up. Where's the kid? As far as I can determine, he's gone off to supervise his eggs. Eggs? Well, what's he doing with eggs? Eating them, I should imagine. I'm a goon. Six years. Six years I've been working for old man Yancey. Now I let his only kid go the way of sin. Whiskey and women. Oh, I'm going to Kendall. Might as well start looking for a new spread. Yancey won't take me back for sure when he finds out. That's Devlin. And I guess this is the last round. That's trail boss. Where's the kid, Nick? Oh, yeah. He... Went to get some grub. Thought you had orders to stick close by. You been drinking? Me? Oh, shucks, Dad. Oh, say, this here's Mr. Kendall. He's a, a newspaper man. Yeah, howdy. Mr. Devlin. Are you sure the kid's all right, Nick? Oh, sure, I'm sure. Why shouldn't he be? He's just going to fix himself some eggs. Well, you watch him, Nick. Because if anything happens, you'll be putting your saddle in the wagon. Oh, I know it, Dad. I sure do know it. So don't you worry. Ain't nothing gonna happen to that little boy. No, sir. As to what did happen to that boy, I must take the word of Millie. In effect, the following events took place. First of all, Kid Yancey and Millie left Bill's place through the kitchen exit. The kid evidently found that the chaperone was something that he could well dispense with. On their way to the Silver Dollar, he stopped at a street corner and became enthralled with a three-card Monty thrower. A small crowd was gathered around watching this expert card sharp. Hey, 
Hey, you are. Hey, you are. The ace, the diamonds is the winning card. Here it is. Follow it, gentlemen and lady. Follow it with your eyes as I shuffle. Here it is. And here. And now here. And now here. And now where? The game is simple. You win if you point it out the first try. You lose if you can't. Here it is. Simple. Watch it again. The ace of diamonds is the winning card. Hey, did you the see that, Mel? Ah, oh, come on, honey boy. You don't want to play that. It ain't on the level. Just accept No, 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 it ain't. I saw the ace. I could have picked it right off. I can think of better ways to spend your money. Oh, well, sure. There's plenty of them. Come on, why don't we get down to the silver dollar, kid, baby? I bet you ain't never drunk champagne, have you? No, well, I ain't too ill before I'm through and shine. Ah, oh, let's go, honey. He ain't nothing but a shot. All right, in a minute. I gotta watch this fella. You're gonna make me a real I'll bet you $20, huh? I'll bet you. Ah, here's a man with guts. Yes, sir. Put her up. Put it up. All right, now, the ace of diamonds. Here it is. And here, and here, and here. Now, where is it? Right there. <laughs> Sorry, my friend. It. It is there. Uh, sure, that's it. Sure, it is. Now, I reckon you pay me $20, huh, mister? Yeah, that, that's right, boy. Twenty. Uh, maybe you'd like to try it again for, say, fifty? Sure, ain't nothing to it. Aw, oh, kid, I bet your ma don't like you gambling. You come along with me now. Yeah, fifty it is. Find the ace. The ace. Here it is, and here, and here, and here, and here. Now, where is it? There, I swear. There. Ha! Well, I tell you, <laughs> jumps, this ain't no more than shooting the head off a chicken with a scattergun. <laughs> hey, you want to play some more, mister? There's another 50 you owe me. They played some more, and when it was over, the card shop packed up his table and stole away, poorer by some $300. The kid explained to Millie that he had played the game in Texas when he was six years old, and that he always won. It was as simple as that. I didn't see Kid Yancey again for three days, and that was for only a few minutes before Nick Condy and the other men of the trail outfit were about to set off once again for Texas. The kid rode up on his cow pony, looking very tall in the saddle. By his side walked Millie, a very thoughtful, subdued Millie. The trail boss, Devlin, and Nick exchanged a relieved glance. Hey, kid, I thought we was going to believe in you and shine in. Not me, Nick. I got to get back to Mom and Pa. Hey, how are you, Mr. Kendall? Real nice of you to come and see us off. Not at all, kid. We were worried about you. Why, well, shoot, there wasn't nothing to worry about. Was there, Mill? No, there weren't nothing. Well, kid, let's roll the cotton. Come on, boys. Oh, oh, oh. Goodbye, Nick. So long, Mill. Here. You buy yourself a pretty, huh? You take it easy there, Kendall. And you. A hundred dollars. He. He gave me a hundred dollars. I'm amazed he had anything left. He had plenty left, Mr. Kendall. You come buy me a drink. I'll tell you all about it. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Eddie Firestone, Gene Carson, Jack Moyles, Vic Perrin, and Charles Seal. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentleman, Bud Sewell speaking.
I met a justice of the peace in Wyoming Territory and saw two kinds of justice done. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his purple and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall. Frontier Gentlemen. <laughs> South Pass District of Wyoming Territory, there is a mining settlement called Dry Creek. Carrie Chase, editor of the Cheyenne Daily Press, had mentioned the fact that a new justice of the peace had been appointed to Dry Creek. This in itself was not particularly newsworthy, except for the fact that the J.P. was a woman, Mrs. Amy Robinson, and as far as we could determine, one of the first of her sex to hold such an office in the United States. 300... The West, and a few days later, found me in Dry Creek. I had expected to see the usual rip-roaring mining community and was surprised to find instead an atmosphere of complete contrast. There was an oppressive quiet to the place. Small groups of men stood here and there, talking in low tones, pausing as I walked by to stare at me suspiciously. Outside the assayer's office, I saw two miners coming out and stopped to ask them directions. A uh, strange around here, ain't you? Yes. And how come you want to talk with the justice of the peace? <laughs> well, I should think that's a matter between the lady and myself. Are you a friend of Mrs. Robinson? No. Are you a lawyer, fella? No. She's down the street there, runs the general store. Thank you. You see, we don't, we don't like strangers asking questions around here. <laughs> so I gathered. Good afternoon. Hey, uh, you tell Mrs. Robinson we ain't changed our minds neither. That red dog, he's going to get a stiff rope and a short drop, no matter what she says. Hello? Is anybody here? Come in. Well, something I can get you. You are Mrs. Amy Robinson? The same. My name is J.B. Kendall. I'm a newspaper correspondent for the London Times. Now, what in the name of sins a London Times correspondent doing in Dry Creek? <laughs> You're the reason, Mrs. Robinson. I think a great many women in England would be interested in reading about a female justice of the peace. You being flippity? No, no, not at all. I'm quite serious. Well, you got to excuse me. There's a lot of folks hereabouts ain't taking my appointment to heart. I think perhaps I met one of them on my way here. Oh, who? Oh, a miner. He suggested that I tell you that they haven't changed their minds. I I get the feeling that there's some discussion about a hanging. Your oh. feeling's correct, mister. Sheriff Godey's got the accused locked up and waiting for trial. Jack Red Dog's a fella, a Rapaho Indian. There's them says he done murder. Killed Big Nose George Haney's brother, Ike. That's what they say. I see. Well, uh, when does the trial take place? As soon as I can get a jury to sit. There ain't no man in Dry Creek will do it. You can't get a jury, huh? Well, uh, come on in the back. I was just making some coffee. Uh -huh. Here, take a chair, Mr. Kendall. Uh. You see, before all this happened, I was Widow Robinson who ran the general store. Folks was decent and nice to me. Then I get appointed justice of the peace, and it's like I got the epistutic. Just because I'm a woman is all. Well, I tell you something. This here Jack Red Dog case is my first, and I aim to see fair trial done, whether they like it or not. Oh, thank you. Uh, what about the talk of hanging? Well, that's Big Nose George and Tip Butler. They're trying to get the fellas riled up to take the engine out and string him up without a trial. And from the looks of the men as I came into town, they seem to be making some headway. Well, they ain't going to do it. 
I swore to uphold the peace and justice in the community, and Amy. by... Amy, you there? Was that you, Sheriff? Yeah. Well, come on back. Now, uh, you uh, better come out yourself. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh. Oh, this fellow's name is Kendall. Come to do some writing about me. Mr. Kendall, meet Harry Godey, Sheriff of Dry Creek. Harry Sheriff, Kendall. how do you do? Yeah, things ain't getting on so good, Amy. I've been thinking it might be better if I take Red Dog over to Rock Springs till he get this thing settled. You're doing no such thing, Harry Goaty. Now, listen to me, Amy. Big Nose George ain't fooling. He's fixing to take that Indian out and hang him. How do you know that? Well, he wants me to join up with him and the other boys to do it. What did you tell him, Sheriff? No, Amy, no sense going on the prod. I'm just telling you what they aim to do. I ain't courting trouble. That's why I'm saying I want to get Jack Red Dog out of here. And have him tried somewhere else? Show that I can't run a trial in my own town? That nobody ain't got no respect for a justice of the peace in Dry Creek because she's a woman? Oh, no, sir. No, sir, Harry Goaty. I'm telling you, I'm ordering you as sheriff to protect that engine till it's time to call the trial. I'll do my best, you know that, Amy, but there's going to be trouble. Well, then get yourself a couple of deputies. Can't. I ain't having none of it. Well, what about Dollar Bill Orpin? He's up in the hills. So it's the whole town, huh? I told you, Amy. I told you they wouldn't stand for a woman judge. You didn't believe me. And I told you a woman's got as much right as a man's... Not in a man's work, Shane, Amy. What do you want, Big Nose? We're a committee. We come here to tell you... Tell me what? That engine's guilty. We already tried it's it. not legal, you didn't... We found him guilty, didn't we, boys? Now we ain't got nothing against you, Ed. Right now, I'm declaring court's in session, boys. The name's Judge Robinson. Now, go ahead and say your piece, but I'll remind you about contempt. Yeah, all right, Judge. Your Honor, we just saved you the trouble of holding a trial. What do you mean? Well, now, Tip's saying that that engine Red Dog shot my brother. And we're going to use him to trim a tree. That's lynching. Begin the law, Big Nose. Now, keep out of this, will you, Goaty? Ain't nothing you can do about it. It's you and her again, all of us. And me. Who are you? Kendall, deputy sheriff. Hey, since when? Listen, this fella just waltzed into town and asked the way to Amy. That's contempt, Tip Butler. It's Judge Robinson. Ten dollars or two days in the Hooskow. <laughs> oh, come on, now, Amy. Ain't no use. Twenty dollars or five days. This fella ain't no deputy. Sure he is. Goaty just swore him in, didn't you, Sheriff? I sure did. Twenty dollars or five days, Butler? Which is it? Well, which is it to be, Butler? Yeah. Now, that'll cost you another ten. Pick up that money and hand it over. You make me, Amy Robinson. You go ahead. Anybody's got ideas of starting something over this, just remember there's only two of you, Sheriff. Now, I wouldn't want Miss Amy here to get hurt. So, supposing you all just stay in here till we finish what we've got to do with that there engine killer. All right, come on, boys. Goaty, you've got to stop them. Well, they got a right to go on down the jailhouse if they've a mind to. They'll get Jack Red Dog. No, they won't. They took him out before I come here. Hit him. Oh, I want to thank you, mister, for standing by us. Of course, you ain't made many friends doing it. Oh, I didn't expect to. Uh, what's going to happen when they find the Indians gone? Oh, they'll come looking for me. Now, Amy, you, you've seen how things are. I'll be taking Red Dog to Rock Springs. Oh, no. There ain't no pack of cussed hardtails going to stampede me. And at this point, I'm inclined to agree with the sheriff. We can't fight the whole town. You'll both sell me out, huh? Because I'm a woman. You won't stand up against them. Oh, it ain't that at all. What, then? I took my oath to uphold what's right. You did the same, Harry Goaty. And I'll do it, too. But this ain't the way. The engine's as good as dead if he stays in town. No sense whittle-wanging, Amy. My job's to protect Red Dog till he comes to trial. I'm going to do just that. Uh, Kendall, you want to be a deputy? No fooling? If you need me. Oh, I need you. You're sworn as of right now. Is that a horse? No, I came in on the stage. Uh, we'll get you one. Amy, as yeah? soon as I get the engine to Rock Springs, I'll be back. Let's go, Kendall. All right. Stable's just across the road. 
Better keep your eyes skinned. You know how to use that blue lightning you're carrying? I've used a gun before. Yeah, I sure hope you don't have to today. All of them fellas is my friends in better times. Where's the Indian? Get out in the stable. Yeah. You think he's still there? Yeah, if he ain't, he's taking a mighty big wagon with him. I handcuffed him to a wheel. I figure by now old Big Nose George is busting his gut down to the jailhouse. We'll have to plumb light a shuck out of here. Hey, Jack. Yes? Well, Injun, you don't know how close you are to catching the rope croup. Oh, uh, we'll take them two horses already saddled, Kendall. Jack will ride with me. Uh, right. Good Easy, is boy. You know, go to let them hang red dog. I know kill like Haney. Come on, now. We'll get you over to Rock Springs. If you're going to hang, you'll hang legal, that's for sure. Which one do you want me to ride, Sheriff? Uh, take the room. He's a salty devil, but if you can handle him, he's a lot of horse. All right, now, let's lead him out. That's just fine, Goaty. Now, you boys, stop right there, unless you want us to start throwing lead. Well, sir, I guess you figured you was right smart, didn't you, Sheriff? This engine's in my custody, boys. I'm warning you. Yeah, don't you worry none about that, Goaty. We'll take care of him and that engine, boy. He's going to be the guest of honor at drink party. Ain't you, Red Dog? In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Some people believe only in what they want to believe. The vast majority of us, however, are prepared to examine the facts. Now, that, in a nutshell, explains the widespread popularity CBS newsman Alan Jackson enjoys. Six days a week, get the story as it happens, as most of these CBS radio stations present Alan Jackson and the news. And now, we return you to the Anthony Ellis production of Frontier Gentlemen. We stood near the door of the stable, Sheriff Godey, Jack Red Dog, and myself. The Indian's face was bathed in a shaft of dust-speckled sunlight. I noticed a scar running from the bridge of his nose across his cheek. His eyes were very dark, frightened. A dozen or more men crowded into the entrance, two or three carrying rifles, the others drawn guns. Big Nose George Haney and Tip Butler took our gun belts away from us. You can't do it, boys. Want to bet on a goatee? Why not give the man a trial? If he's guilty, he deserves to. He's guilty right enough, ain't no doubt. A couple of you boys help me get a rope over that beam. It'll be murder, Tip. Oh, can't man. murder an Indian, Sheriff. They just plain oh, dying which way. Right. Nobody's accountable killing an Indian. Are you afraid to give him a trial? I told you, mister, we'd done it. Not legal, you didn't. Not legal. That's how come we got a justice of the peace. Woman justice, you know better than that, Goaty. I ain't a shouting for suffrage, but she was appointed. Now, boss, you aren't. My in-law is good enough for me. Mr. Big Nose, I don't kill your brother. I was asleep that night with red eye, much whiskey. You ask Tip Butler. I'd be asking the wrong feller, because he's the one seen you do it. That's fact. Ike Haney and Red Dog friends. Red Dog didn't have need for killing. He was drunk, Jack. He shot him in the back. I saw it. Let's get it over with, boys. Uh, bring him over. <laughs> no, no. They're my son, my woman. Who cared for them? Give him a chance. Maybe Butler was mistaken. Sure, it was dark, Tip. Might have been another Indian, somebody else. I see him with my own eyes, I'm telling you. Well, if you saw him, why didn't you catch him then? Instead of waiting till morning, you and Big Nose sent me over to arrest him. Like you said, it was dark. Couldn't catch him. Tie his hands back of him, Tommy. Oh, I, I, I give you my claim. Much gold in it. All yours. You let me go. I give you... If you gotta die, die like a man. This ain't no time to crawl. We'll give you a chance to say a prayer. You got an Indian prayer on you? How many white men you kill without they get a chance for prayer, huh? I kill no man. Except my brother. That's enough for the hang. All right, help me get him up on a horse. You can't. It's lynching, and we're finished with that. Listen yeah. to me. No, no, hang. No, no, no. Take no. your hands off him. Put away the scatter gun, Amy. This ain't no concern of yourn. 
What's got to be done has got to be. Sheriff, take your prisoner down off that horse. Walk him up to the jailhouse. Get her! Oh, no. Take your hands off. Stay right where you are, mister. All right, now get on with it. Wait. Wait now. If you do this thing, every one of you will be as guilty as you think the Indian is. I feel no guilt, mister. My brother's got his lamp blowed out, but this here Rappaho, I ain't feel no guilt. Then why not let the law decide? You're the law, all of you. Given the right to defend himself, form your jury, prosecute him, but not this way. He's right. Listen to him. He's wrong. Dead wrong. He ain't even American, that fancy talk and all. You shut your mouth, mister, or you go with the engine. So long, Jack. If you see my brother, you tell him hello to me, no, huh? No, no, no! They didn't look at Jack Red Dog when they finally cut him down. It is they tried not to. Nor could they look at each other. One spoke of getting a drink, and the others agreed that a man could work up quite a thirst at a lynching. The shaft of sunlight fell on the dead man's frayed moccasin. I sure hope he was guilty. Would that make it better? He spoke of a wife and child. Yeah, they live up behind the Black Canyon diggings. I'm thinking it's my fault, all of this. It taint your fault, Amy. Maybe it happened because a woman was made justice of the peace. They was forced to do what they did. If it had been a man, maybe they'd have listened to him. They don't want to hear a woman's words. Not in a man's world. You did what you could. It wouldn't have made any difference. They were bound to hang him. Mostly, I think, because he was an Indian. Well, I'll take him up to his wife. Better time on the horse. No. I'll bring my wagon. Put him in that. He rode his last horse. Well, we, we will help you hitch it up. Hey, Goldie! Ah, that's Dollar Bill Orpin. Howdy. Hey, I hear him and Jack Red Dog's in the who's dog for shooting I can't eat, that's so. Not anymore, it ain't Dollar Bill. He's in there. He just had us a necktie party. Hey, no, that ain't so good. How come? Thought you was justice of the peace, Mrs. Robinson. I thought so, too. Well, they sure hadn't ought to have done that. Rappahoe Jack, he didn't kill nobody. What do you mean? I mean, just that, stranger. Night A. Caney was killed, Jack Red Dog come around to my diggings looking for whiskey. He was sure high lonesome. I told him, I said, Jack, you don't need no more bug juice. You better go lie down summers before you slip and fall in the canyon, break your fool neck. Oh, man, he was so drunk he fell down three times going down the hill to his wiki up. Dropped his gun. Hey, I got it right here. So if he shot Ike, he did it with somebody else's thumbbuster. He was telling the truth. He said he was asleep, drunk when it happened. Yeah, and Tip says he saw him shoot. Funny how certain he was about that. Sheriff, you swear in Dollar Bill right now as deputy. You're sworn, Bill. I swear. Want to have some fun? We're going down to the saloon. Hey, let me tie up my mule. I'll be right along. There'll be no more drinking. Court's in session. Oh, go on home, Amy. We don't One want One more to... word out of you, big nose, and I'll have you rested. Oh. Your Honor, may I speak for the court? Yes, sir. You go ahead. This court is going to investigate two murders. One, the shooting of Ike Haney by persons unknown. And two, the strangulation of Jack Red Dog committed by those persons. Present. He's loco. Set up another round of drinks. Sheriff, arrest that man for contempt. 
Tip Butler, you make a move and I'll blow your head off. Now go on, Mr. Kendall. We have a witness to the fact that the Indian Jack Red Dog may have been telling the truth when he said that he was asleep at the time of Haney's murder. You're a liar. No, he ain't. I seen him that night. He was so drunk he couldn't have plugged nothing. Besides, he didn't have no gun. I sure he did. I seen him. You saw him shoot? Yeah, I saw. How many times did he fire? Uh, three, four. It was dark? Uh, dark. And you were close enough to recognize Jack Red Dog? Yeah, yeah, I was close enough. What did he do with his gun after he shot Haney? Uh, he, uh, he threw it away. Uh, no, 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 he put it back in his belt. Which? Uh, listen, mister, I, I don't have to answer no fancy law wrangler questions. Yes, you do. You're a witness in this trial. Answer the questions, Tip. Did he throw away the gun? Uh, no. Sheriff, when you arrested Red Dog, did he have a gun? Nope. Of course he didn't. He dropped it up to my diggings the night Haney was bushwhacked. I got it right here. How come? How come you had time to see Red Dog shoot Ike three times, put the gun back in his belt, and not do nothing about it, Tip? I, I told you it was dark. I, I couldn't catch him. But it wasn't too dark to see him. Uh, that's right. How close were you? Well, I don't know. A few feet, I guess. How come you didn't start shooting yourself, Tip? Uh, I never got the chance, Big Nose. What was you doing? Just watching? Uh, no. How come you was up there anyway, snooping around Ike's diggings that night? Well, Ike and me was going partners. We was going to talk about it. Ike never said nothing to me about another partner. Uh, he, he was going to. Is that why you shot him? Because he wouldn't take you in? Uh, it wasn't me. It was that engine. Uh, Ike and me was talking, and Red Dog sneaks up and shoots Ike. You told me you never got a chance to talk to Ike. When you got to him, he was already laid out dead. Well, I, I, I mean... Uh, what you mean is that you bushwhacked Ike. Your own self. Put away your gun, Haney. My brother. You did it, Tip. No, 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 don't. Hey. I'm sorry I missed. I should have killed you, Haney. Sheriff. Take Tip over to the jailhouse and hold him for murder. I didn't attend the trial of Tip Butler for the murder of Haney's brother. The jury that lynched Jack Red Dog found Butler guilty. Justice of the Peace Amy Robinson pronounced sentence, and I heard a few days ago the man was hanged. <laughs> Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Paula Winslow, Jack Moyles, Lou Krugman, Jack Crucian, and Tom Holland. Congratulations to CBS radio affiliate WVAM Altoona, Pennsylvania, observing its 10th anniversary this month. again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Bud Sewell speaking.
Laramie, Wyoming Territory, I met a square-jawed sheriff named Will Harper and his slack-jawed deputy named Clem. Um, I also lost $20. Frontier Gentlemen. an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. <laughs> taken the stagecoach from Dry Creek and was on my way back to Cheyenne. Beside myself, there were two other passengers. One, a gaunt, stern-faced man named Barnaby, who had spent most of his waking hours reading from the Bible. The other, Thad Clark, a miner who, having made a modest fortune, was on his way to his home in Illinois. It was late afternoon, the stage lurching along the well-worn road a few miles to the west of Laramie. I tell you, fellas, I'm going to order me a, do a dozen fresh eggs and all the fancy fluff duffs they got in the best eating place in Laramie. A man should not be a slave to his stomach. Well, that ain't exactly I'm a slave, Mr. Barnaby. But I, I sure won't mind pampering it for a while. If you'd eaten as much jerky and drunk as much brown gargle as I have, you'd go along with me. I'd go along, Mr. Clark. Once, you know, once for two months... I had to live on nothing but dried fish and rice. It was in India. A heat, even lad. Uh, you know, I got a hank hankering to do some traveling. Might be I'll take a trip out there, China, India. I got me enough gold dust in that little box to do a lot of things like that. The love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah, if it is, I'm sure going to find out when we hit last. What is it? What's the matter? The riders blocking the road. Now don't get scared, folks. Just a hold up. Hold up? Yeah, if you got guns, keep them where they are. There's too many of them to put up a fight. My gold. Listen, I worked three years for that. Let's shoot it out. What do you say, Kendall? You got a gun. Now look out the window. Five, six of them. Odds are against us, I'm afraid. They were on horseback, their faces completely masked cradling rifles and shotguns in their arms. Two of them remained in front of the coach. Three more took up positions to either side and behind. The sixth man, who appeared to be the leader, called to us to get out. Our driver nonchalantly climbed down from his seat and began to roll a cigarette. The miner, Clark, stood next to me, right hand clenched, hovering over his gun butt. You, mister. And you. Do you mean me? No, no, the tall fella, another one. Unbuckle your gun belts and drop them. No need for anyone to get hurt. I'm a poor man. I have no worldly goods. Sorry to hear that, brother. You a preacher? No. That's too bad. I never rob a sky pilot. Just empty out your pockets, all of you. Driver? Yeah. What you carrying? Nothing much. Well, we'll take a look, see. Jed, Frank, keep them covered. C.D., you help me search them. All right. Driver, climb up there and throw down the boxes. Sure. All right, James. Nice and quiet. Let's tell your kids all about it. It's kind of a puny wallet. Don't take that. It's all I have. Thirty, forty, fifty dollars. Well, now you ain't got any worldly goods for sure, Frank. What about him, C.D.? Two dollars is all. You take a look in the coach. All right. Driver, climb down. Open up them boxes. Sure. All right, now you, mister. Here. You won't find much. That's well, a right handsome looking watch you got there. I like it. Take it off. No. 
<laughs> Come on now, take it off. It has a great sentimental value to me. It can't be worth more than a few dollars to that you. It all adds up, mister. Take it off. No. <laughs> you figure it's worth your life? In a way. Hey! Hey, look at here what I found! Uh, who belongs to this? It's mine. Just ain't no use asking you to leave it be. That's a fact. It sure breaks my heart the way you river snipers have to sweat to get that much dust. Give him back a sack of it, C.D., and see what's in the mother boxes. Here you are, partner. Enough for grubs. Now, yeah, about that watch. Is it worth killing me for it? <laughs> Mister, that's a plumb low-code question. I plugged a fellow once over a chaw at the back. What's your name? Kendall. I'd like to meet a man with guts. All right, you keep that watch, Kendall. It's a present. And the breeze, boys, there's riders coming up the road. Hold on, fellas. Clark, pick up your gun. Hey, you got one. You got him. The wounded man clung to his saddle for a few yards, then toppled over, fell to the ground and was still. The others disappeared in a cloud of dust along the road to the west. A moment or two later, a group of horsemen rode up. They were led by an exceedingly tall man wearing a large and rather ornate badge. Where'd you to go? Hey, they went that way. They hey, Kendall, here, got one. He's lying Everything right over the eye. I eyes. have. You must get it. Clem, you and the boys get after him. we do that, Sheriff. <laughs> You uh, recognize any of them, darling? No. Must be new around here, Sheriff. I never did see them before. I figure I've been held up by most of the hold-up men in the territory. All right, let's take a look at that fellow you shot. Lucky few gents, we came along. Very lucky. Sure hope your boys catch up with them. Don't worry, we'll get them. Hmm. Well, that's the last roundup for this outlaw. Lob him through the head. I shouldn't, mister. Well, let's get that mask off. Uh, any of you ever see him before? I no, told you, I no, I, no. No papers. I didn't think there would be. Well, I guess you gents can go on your way. I'd be obliged if you'll stop by my office in Laramie and make out a report of what was taken. Name's Harper. Will Harper. Hey, uh, you're new in Laramie, ain't you, Sheriff? Yeah, just took over last month. Aim to do some cleaning up. You got no worries. We'll have your valuables back by tonight. The sheriff followed his posse. <coughs> we went on to Laramie. On our arrival, Mr. Barnaby went off with a severe-looking woman, whom I assumed to be his wife. Thad Clark was kind enough to take me to dinner. Afterwards, we walked down to the sheriff's office. He sat behind his desk, powerful, square-jawed, steely-eyed, the picture of an iron-nerved man of the law. At a smaller desk, his discreet deputy was filling out some papers. Harper looked up as we came in, nodded briskly. Evening, Jan. Sit down, sit down. Clam, fetch another chair. Yes, sir, Mr. Harper. You caught those fellas, huh? We trailed them, all right. Yeah, make yourself come. Uh, thank you. I gather that you didn't catch them? Well, like I say, we know where they are just a matter of time. My deputy here, Clem, he's making out the report right now. I better get back to it, Clem. Yes, sir, Mr. Harper. Now, uh, you uh, want to give me a list of what was stolen? Not much of a list, Sheriff. Just ten sacks of gold dust, about $5,000. You get that, Clem? I sure did, sir. And uh, you, uh, Kendall's the name, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Uh, $20 in my wallet. Uh, Kendall, Kendall. Uh, say, aren't you that English newspaper fellow I heard about back in Cheyenne? I'm an English newspaper man, yes. Well, I'm proud, mighty proud. I reckon you'll be writing all this up for your paper. I imagine I will. Good, good. And you'll get a chance to see how we take care of bad men in Laramie. Things are going to be different around here. I'd admire to have you stick around, Kendall. 
We've got new methods, scientific, like they've been using in the East. That's fine, but what about my gold? Those hold-up boys must be in Colorado by now. <laughs> you hear that, Clint? <laughs> I sure did, sir. <laughs> That's a funny one. That is funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you where they are, gents. Right this minute, I can put my finger on them. But I'm going to wait for morning. They're holed up in the Centennial Mine, digging it's about 30 miles west of here. That's where we traveled them, isn't it, Clem? That's the place, sir. We got four men watching right this minute. Kendall, how'd you like to ride out to me in the morning and uh, watch us pull in a bunch of outlaws? It'd be very interesting, Sheriff. Oh, this will be just about the most important story you've ever read. And... I'll be glad to help you make your name, Kendall. Ah, uh, well, well, that's awfully kind of you. Sheriff! Thank you. Sheriff! I've seen one of them. Maybe two, maybe all of them. Well, now, now, easy, partner. Easy. I, I tell you, they're down at Lazy Kate's saloon. Them same fellas did the hole up this afternoon. No, no, driver, it can't be. We know where they are. We sure do, mister. Up in Centennial. And they came back to Laramie. I recognize a voice. Now, now, voices can fool you. Take my word. We got them boxed in 30 miles away. It's them. I swear I can pick them out even without the masks. Uh, do you think it might be an idea to go down and have a look, Sheriff? Just in case. Man's an almighty fool not to follow lead. You want I should take the scatter guns, Mr. Harper? Don't see there'll be a need, Clem, if it's them, which I know it isn't. The old peacemakers will do our talking. Yes, sir. Driver, you come and point out your suspects. Clark, you better stay put. All right with me. Just get that gold dust back. That's all I want. Say, I'd rather like to come along, too, if you don't mind, Sheriff. You may be a greenhorn, Kendall, but you got guts. Let's go. In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. CBS newsmen Walter Cronkite and Wells Church have teamed up to bring you a concise but comprehensive nightly report. Sunday through Thursday evening, join us on CBS Radio when it's time for Walter Cronkite and the News. <coughs> Friday and Saturday night at the same time, hear Wells Church and the News on most of these same stations. Both men are experts on world affairs, and each in his own way makes following the news an exciting adventure. And now we return you to the Anthony Ellis production of Frontier, gentlemen. For the second time that day, I had been apprised of the fact that my guts were organs of some consequence. Once by an outlaw who had stolen my wallet and its contents, and again by an outside sheriff who wore a diamond-studded badge and carried two tremendous guns low on his hips. The four of us walked down the street. Sheriff Harper, his deputy, whom I only knew as Clem, the stagecoach driver, and myself. We arrived at the Lazy Kate Saloon. It was fairly well crowded, but almost immediately, the driver spotted the men in question and pointed them out to us. Two of them, their backs to us, standing at the bar. These the ones. Maybe the other fellows alongside, too. I never did get a good look at them. All right. You better stay here, driver. Kendall, you stay behind Clemens. If you think you recognize the voices, just sing out. You bet I will, Sheriff. Let's go, Clem. You take that Jill Smith and West. I don't say she can't do the job, but I'll ride along with old Colt 44. Now, that's for sure. That there's one sweet piece of artillery. I beg your pardon, uh, gentlemen. What? Haven't we met before? You talking to me, mister? That's right. This the man, Kendall? It's his voice. Looks like him. The other chap's the one he called C.D. Oh, Sheriff, is there something wrong? What's your name, mister? Fred Cole. You? Sylvester. Noah Sylvester. Who are these other boys? Who are them? I don't know. I never saw them before tonight. All right, keep your hands on the bar, gents. Oh, Sheriff, we supposed to have done something? A slight matter of a hold-up this a afternoon. A hold -up. Us? Search him, Clem. Watch out for a belly gun. Yes, sir, Mr. Harper. But, but mister, you got the wrong man. Me and Noah, we ain't no leather slap. No. <laughs> Shucks, I don't even carry a gun. Me neither. They're clean, Sheriff. For sure we're clean. <laughs> you got us mistook for two other fellas, mister. I don't think so. I'm taking you both in. The stagecoach driver identified you as well. If it's a mistake, you got nothing to worry about. If it isn't. 
There'll be empty saddles for you and the misty beyond. Let's go. He took them back to the sheriff's office and they were locked up, protesting rather mildly and seemingly quite unworried. I could see that their manner had a profound effect on Harper. He must have felt that in my eyes his reputation was at stake. Unequivocally, he had stated that the hold-up men were trapped 30 miles away in the mine shafts of Centennial. Now, three of the victims had identified the ringleaders under his very nose in Laramie. He must have found it rather awkward, because after an hour or so of questioning, he faced Clark, the driver, and me, and said, Gentlemen, I've questioned those boys in there for better than an hour. I reckon I know men as well as the next man, maybe some better. And I'll say here and now that those fellows are innocent. They're not. Here, Listen, I know those voices anywhere. I know how you feel. But in the morning when we bring the outlaws in, you'll thank me. And you won't have it on your conscience that two innocent cowpunchers were unjustly locked up. In other words, you're going to release these men? Well, that's about the size of it, Kendall. <laughs> in spite of the fact that all three of us know their voices... We couldn't all be wrong. Even so, you're going to let them go? Well, now, Kendall, this is a matter of law. They got nothing on them, sure as they took any of your valuables. You identify a voice, but not a face. And that isn't going to stand up in court. Besides, there isn't much I don't know when it comes to following signs. That sure is so. Sheriff used to be a scout for Colonel Custer. Those uh, hold-up men never double back to Laramie. You can take my word for it. Uh, would, there, would there be any harm in holding these chaps at least until you bring in the others in the morning? Well... A at least on suspicion. Kendall, I wouldn't want you writing in your paper that the sheriff of Laramie took the law in his own hands. I've got a mighty big job to do in this town, mighty big. You're worrying about your job in his newspaper. I'm worrying about my $5,000 they robbed off me. Well, I guess I could hold them till morning. I could do that. That's all we want. You know, ever since I seen that big fella without his mask, I got a feeling. What sort of a feeling, Driver? Incidentally, what is your name? Driver? Elwood Driver. <laughs> kind of gets you, don't it? Me being a stagecoach driver and all? Driver! Well, anyways, about that fella, I, I keep thinking maybe I seen him somewhere. Where? I don't hey, know. Hey, Sheriff. Yeah? What do you want, Cole? Me and Sylvester, we was wondering, how about some grub? Sure. Clem, go across the eatery and get them to rustle up some grub for the boys. Sure will, Mr. Harper. I guess I'll check in at a hotel and get some shut-eye. You can share my room if you want, Kendall. Well, thank you. As a matter of fact, I hey, was... Chef. Yeah? Well, me and Sylvester, we just thought of something. Maybe we can prove that we ain't the fellas you're looking for. All right, cool. Speak your piece. Well, now, these fellas, they say they was held up about ten miles outside of Laramie. That's right. And what time? Yeah, what I tell you, Fred. Yeah, yeah. Well, now, Sylvester, he remembers these folks who could tell you we was right here in Laramie all afternoon and about six-ish. Now, if that's so, we couldn't be in two places to once, could we? That's for sure. Now, that's for sure. You'll have to admit that, Chef. Well, who are your witnesses, boy? Three fellows down to the Sherman Hotel. We were playing billiard, drinking beer with them. I, I, I don't recollect their last names. See, there was a, a Jim... Jim... Jim Hankers. Jim Hankers, Hankers that was, yeah. and then Zach... And Zach and a brother of his, uh, uh, Jake. That's right. You go ask for them, Sheriff. They'll tell you. Well, you'll find I'm a fair man, boy. If you're telling the truth... I'll be fair with you. I knew you'd give us a square deal, Sheriff. It's quite convenient, isn't it? And what? Those three witnesses popping up. Ooh, might be so, Ken. Man's innocent till proved guilty. That's the law. Yeah, but there was six of them in the holdup. Kendall plugged one. That leaves five. Two you got in there, the other three down the Sherman Hotel. My thoughts exactly. You just saying that five outlaws doubled back on me? You reckon I lost the trail of five men? You reckon they'd all be fool enough to come into Laramie after a day I'd hold up? They might be smart enough to. Mr. Kendall, that's a mighty big paper you write for. And I guess you do a real fine job. 
but you're no lawman. I guess it's not I've been patient with you, gents, because I felt sorry for you. But I'm the uh, sheriff of Laramie, and from here on in, I'm going to have to run things my way. Sheriff, it's... No, Soon it's... as Clem gets back, I'm walking down to this Sherman. If I find those boys that Cole and Sylvester say they were with this afternoon, that's all I need to know. You'll free them? That's what I aim to do. It was useless to argue with them. A few minutes later, his deputy Clem returned, and Sheriff Harper strode manfully out of his office. Driver and Clark left a moment afterwards. They were beaten men and were going to the nearest saloon to get drunk. I decided to stay. I had to see what I knew was going to happen. A half an hour later, he came back. One look at the smile on his face told me all I needed to know. Clem, unlock the cell. Yes, sir, Mr. Harper. Why, you found them? Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, just as a matter of curiosity, Sheriff, if they were lying, would you have known it? Yeah, I'd know it. That's why I'm sheriff. Come on out, boys. You found them, huh, Sheriff? And they told you where we was. I owe you gents an apology. Oh, no, that ain't necessary, Sheriff. You were only doing your duty. Well, it's mighty large of you to take it that way. Fred, I guess you'll be on our way, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, say, uh, Mr. Kendall, uh, that there is a right handsome watch you're wearing, Mr. Kendall. But I don't suppose you'd want to part with it. Well, uh, so long. Real Ooh. nice knowing you, Sheriff. Yeah, so long, Sheriff. So I long, Clem. So he, long. He's, he's the same one. It's I tell you, Sheriff. all right, Kim. No, will wait you a minute, take it the, easy. He's the... It's all Mr. right. Mr. Harper. Oh. Mr. Harper. You know, I... I was just looking through these wanted posters that come in in the morning mail. Yeah. Now, now there's one picture here. Oh. Uh. Fellas got a kind of familiar face. Here, here, you see? Well, well, Jesse James, five thousand dollars reward for the capture, dead or alive. Sheriff Kendall, I remember, I remember where I seen that fella. He's Jesse James. That's who, Jesse James. Look, you hear what I'm saying, Jesse James? Jesse James. Uh, Mr. James just left, Sheriff. I don't think he'll be back. This time, Jesse James left Laramie for good, followed a day later by Sheriff Will Harper and his inestimable deputy, Clem. The irate citizens of Laramie gave them quite a send-off. As to how I recovered my $20 and Thad Clark at least a part of his gold is a story I shall telegraph next week. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Ted DeCorsia, Harry Bartell, Lawrence Dobkin, Jack Moyles, Vic Perrin, and Stacey Harris. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Bud Sewell speaking.
Hey. Need strong. To smash something. Tell Strong what to do. You share with Strong? Hey. What? Um, Strong. Yes, human. You can head home now. Strong way to tower for human. Zen weak human to Strong for eating. 